Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started? So hello everyone, this is Meg Bouvier and this is um, Ask the Grant Writing Experts. I'm the creator of your library of NIH grant submission courses. I have over 35 years of experience as an, at NIH as an applicant, an intramural researcher, a staff writer, and now a full-time NIH grant mentor. I've helped clients land over half a billion dollars in federal funding and I'm here to answer your NIH grant writing questions. So grab a cup of coffee and let's get started. So if you are attending live, you'll uh, see that there's a Q&A box on the toolbar for your um, Zoom. You can start typing questions in um, right away. Um, if you are watching this as a recording, this is a disclaimer that um, this is July 10th, 2024. And everything that I'm talking about today is true to the best of my knowledge as of this date, but you should always, always double check NIH and um, have conversations with your program officer to make sure that everything that I'm saying is, is accurate um, in your circumstances at that time. So what you should be doing in the library right now, um, for those of you who are targeting applications in um, October and resubmission applications in November, um, I would imagine that you're working your way through the uh, first two chapters of either Master the R or Master the K series and working your way through the um, checklist, particularly for um, uh, chapter one, the um, the prep steps and, and chapter two, the specific gains. Um, and I know a lot of you um, attended the boot camp, so we talked about uh, some of the homework that you might be working on for that. So hopefully you're in the process of vetting the idea, having conversations with the program officer, et cetera. Okay, so let's pause um, for the tutorial today and just bear with me because I'm uh, I'm working off site today. I'm in New York City. I'm uh, used to having my mission control with lots and lots of monitors and Instead, I'm perched at a desk in my uh, daughter's apartment on the Upper West Side. So I am uh, trying to maneuver the, this from a one tiny little monitor. So bear with me while I pull up the information that I want to share. Okay, so... Um, One sec, current slide. Okay, so let's talk. Um, I know that I covered these slides in the bootcamp and they're readily available to you um, in the Master of the R series course. But sometimes I like to just kind of slow down and do a deeper dive into a given topic so that um, we're not kind of marching through different sections, but just really focusing on one thing and um, people can formulate their questions and we can talk about different scenarios. So let's talk a little bit about the team table. So um, often an applicant will ask me, um, why is this even necessary given that the, you know, the reviewers have access to bio sketches? And um, my answer to that is, as an outside reader, it's really nice to have a scorecard right in the research strategy so that you know, if I'm in the approach section and I'm reading about different um, types of activities that are going to um, occur in a given aim, I don't have to then um, go to a completely different file and start flipping through multiple PDFs of different team members' biosketches to figure out who's doing what. It can be really nice to have a very brief scorecard, if you will, at the beginning of the approach that just kind of gives me a quick and dirty orientation to who the major players are, where they're located, and what they're going to do on the project. I find that really helpful personally. Um, and even if you are somebody who is doing a human subjects project, um, so for people doing clinical trials, the detailed description of the team is going to go into section 3.5 of the human subjects form. And that's actually one of the optional sections for uh, people who are doing a human subjects non-clinical trial. Sections um, 3.3 to 5 are optional for uh, the human subjects non-clinical trial people. So you're going to have a detailed description of the team in that section. I still like to have a really brief, quick and dirty kind of scorecard at the beginning of the approach just to give me an idea of who the major players are, where they're located, what their degrees are in, and what their expertise is in, and, and um, what they're going to do on the project. 
So I've listed here some of the um, typical components that you would see. Um, your um, name, your degree. So um, it, I do not find it helpful when people say doctor so-and-so. I want to know if this person is an MD, a PhD, a DO, MPH. Like what, what, is, what is their degree? Um, what's their primary affiliation? That can be hugely helpful, particularly if you have uh, multiple sites involved. Um, if it's just everybody's on one site, you can just say that like in a table um, legend, all, all team members are located at, you know, XYZ University. Your role on the project, so are you a PI, a co-investigator, et cetera? We're going to talk a little, do a little deeper dive into what um, the different um, roles are at NIH and how they define them. Um, if you are doing a, a career development award, one of the uh, K awards, um, what is that person? So the team table is typically for a project, right? So if you're doing a K, the team table is for the project, but does this person also have a role um, on your advisory committee? Are they a mentor? Are they not part of the advisory committee, but they play a role on the project somehow? What type of expertise that person has? Um, and that could be something really um, quick and dirty, like, an, you know, they're an, a biostatistician. You could, you know, even use like a one word thing. And then exactly um, what are they going to do on the project? So, you know, will they um, oversee the data analyses for a given aim, et cetera? So this is a obviously made up anonymized version of um, how I like to structure uh, the team table. And I find a template like this really helpful because if you're working from a template like this, it ensures that you haven't left any information out. So among the thing, things that I like to do, as I said, are to include um, the name. If you have a team that is largely women and they're in an underrepresented field, a field in which they're underrepresented, I would include their first name so that it's clear to the reviewers that there are women on this team and it's, you know, uh, an engineering project or whatever it is that um, is, is a field in which they might be underrepresented. Again, their degrees and so not just calling them doctors so and so their primary affiliation, particularly if um, they're at different um, organizations, it could, it's helpful to know where they're located. Their role on the project, are they a PI or a multi-PI co-investigator consultant? And again, we'll do a deeper dive into that in a moment. Their expertise for the team, um, what they will do um, on a given um, part of the project. So like the PI, often there's, uh, like a phrase that says they will oversee all aspects of the project. You know, if it's a multi-PI plan, one PI might oversee um, a certain um, type of experiment in AIM-1, another PI might be another set of experiments in a different AIM. So help us understand that. And then really important, you have to highlight the publications among the team members. And there are a number of ways to do this. One is that you could do it in the um, table legend here. Um, so that can be um, really helpful to just list the references. Another way that people sometimes do this is um, particularly like if it's a larger team and not every team member has published with every other team member, um, you could um, list out um, for each person publications on which there's at least one other team member on the publication. And so you could just kind of march through and do that um, in each description for each person. Um, and I wanted to show you um, this um, diagram that was developed by my client, um, Darwin Conwell at the Ohio State University. This is from a, um, a funded UO one that he and I worked on together. And um, what I liked about this is that there, this is a situation where there were three PIs on this UO one. It was a larger product, like a 30 page UO one with a larger budget. Um, so the three PI plan was certainly um, justified. And just at a glance, you can see that this was the junior person at the time. This was the mid-career and this was the senior person. And you can see the number of publications they have alone with one PI, with the other PI, and with both PIs. And you can see that at a glance for each of these people, which I just thought was kind of an ingenious way um, to depict that information. Um, another sample that I had years ago, and I, I had trouble digging it up, so I'll just describe it to you. 
Um, if you have a situation where you have an extremely large team, let's say it, it's a, like a U54 or some kind of center of excellence where there are groups of people at different um, organizations, um, you could use a table where you group the team members by their primary affiliation. So let's say you have, um, you know, the the site, a site PI and, you know, people at that site. And then you have, um, you know, there's a site PI at a different site, and then there's a third site. You could you could um, group those together, and then within your table, um, merge the cells within a row, and then um, list the name of the site there, and maybe even shade it so that each. So it's all part of one table, but each group of investigators. Um, is is grouped by the site that whichever university it is, and they kind of hang together with that shaded banner in the table that um, lists where they're from. So I'm going to keep looking to see if I can find that um, sample. Um, it's really only relevant for people who are doing very big projects, but given that we're doing a little bit of a deeper dive into teams, I thought I would um, talk about that. So the other thing I would like to do is... Um, to share a the description of um, of uh, NIH how they describe like what each type of team is. Let's say this one. Okay, so you should be seeing something that says uh, types of team roles. So this is a website from NIAID. And we're gonna run through this because I get these questions pretty much every week, all year long. Um, so it's clearly a point of confusion, at least for people who are um, somewhat new to NIH applications. So all of you know what a principal investigator is. It's the person, it's the person who leads the project. They have um, the, the highest percent effort on the project. Um, there is no such thing right now as a co-PI on an NIH grant. It's just called a, a multi-PI, so it's an MPI. And if you opt for an MPI situation, um, a, an arrangement like that, you would write what's called um, an MPI plan. And basically the goal of the MPI plan is to show that the expertise of the PIs is um, complementary but distinct and that both types of expertise are required for the leadership of the team. That's the goal of the MPI plan. Um, Co-investigators are um, those who are involved with the PI and the project scientific development or execution, but don't quite rise to the level of being a full PI. Co-investigators should be listed as senior slash personnel. And of course, you would get a bio sketch from them. So, and they caution, don't use the term co-investigator when what you mean is a multi-PI. You know, those are two different things. Obviously, the, multi, the, the PIs all have higher percent effort and are, um, are running the project, whereas the co-investigator, it doesn't quite rise to that level. I think those are pretty clear to people. It gets a little more confusing as you move into collaborators and consultants. That's where I get most of the questions. So collaborators always play an active role in the research and the position is sometimes defined interchangeably with a co-investigator. As a loose guideline, think of a collaborator as a scientist whose distinct expertise complements your own as the PI, while a co-investigator, which is the one above, shares your area of expertise and therefore contributes in guiding the scientific direction of the overall project. One provides unique, unique expertise, the collaborator, and the other umbrella expertise, that would be the uh, co-investigator. Still many areas of science have their own expectations for each of these roles. So um, long as the role of each contributor is explained well in your personnel justification and any letter of support, your choice between the title of co-investigator and collaborator won't be a point of contention for reviewers. And I, I would agree with that. In fact, I cannot think of a single instance where I've read a set of summary statements. And I probably, just for, um, for reference, I mean, I probably read, I don't know, maybe anywhere from 60 to 100 summary statements a year um, across study sections and institutes. I would be hard pressed to remember an example where um, 
reviewers quibbled about whether you called somebody a collaborator or a co-investigator. So I wouldn't get too hung up on that. I have seen them um, quibble about somebody who um, is listed as a PI where they didn't think they should be, like as a multi-PI, and they, they thought the person should have a lower percent effort. Or conversely, where they thought the person actually was a significant, significant enough contributor that they should have been listed as a PI with a higher percent effort. I've seen both of those, but I've never seen them a reviewer complain about, hey, this co-investigator should have been listed as a collaborator. I've just never seen that. Consultants provide advice or services and may participate significantly in their search. They often help fill in smaller gaps by, for example, supplying software, providing technical assistance or training or setting up equipment. There's usually some kind of narrow expertise um, that's being contributed uh, to the project on the part of the consultant. So um, you would list consultants as senior key personnel only if they will contribute substantively and measurably to the scientific development or execution of a project. Otherwise, see the next section. Um, and if they're not listed as key personnel, and you don't get a bio sketch from them, you absolutely have to have a letter of support from them. And you have to make sure that what they say in the letter of support is consistent with what's in the application. And in fact, I would say that you need to write the letter of support and just leave a few little places, placeholders for them to editorialize a little bit, but you should write the, you know, draft the template for the letter of support. They'll, they'll appreciate it. Um, consultants do not receive a salary from your grant, but may receive a fee. So that's pretty common that um, a consultant would um, receive a fee. Other significant contributors or OSCs commit to contribute to the scientific development or execution of the project, but are not committing any spec uh, specified measurable effort in person months or percent effort to the project. Um, as examples, your mentor on a career development award or a K award, um, or an as needed consultant would be considered an OSC and would not ha typically have percent effort. It would be 0% effort. So if you are um, looking for um, more information on this or want this URL to refer back to, um, this, is, uh, this URL is listed in the chat. So um, you can uh, go in there and grab that. Okay, so let me pull up, um, feel free to uh, type in any questions. Um, everybody's quiet today. I think everybody is like just melting in the heat. <laughs> so I did get a couple of questions um, during the week. So I'm, I'm gonna try to cover those. I do wanna mention that um, I just read um, a couple of times a year, we send out surveys for Ask the Grant Writing Expert and um, people were um, very helpful in um, letting me know what worked for them and what they might change. And one of the things that we had a request for is um, people who were saying, I'm never free on Wednesdays ever. And I really wanna go, um, would you consider alternating Wednesday with another day? And um, we had a conversation on my team and while we thought it would be probably um, not the greatest thing to balance days back and forth, we were thinking of just adding another session on another day. So. Um, one of the things we're thinking of doing is, in addition to doing um, every other Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, we may just add another session once a month for like the first Friday of every month at like 11:30 Eastern. Okay, so like I'm getting I'm getting some positive feedback from attendees for this. So I know that um, a lot of people have said that they they just they have clinics on Wednesday and can never come. So it would be very simple. It would probably just be straight up Q and A, because um, the mini tutorials, you know, people can view recordings of those. But it would give an opportunity for people to um, ask their questions live if um, they can't attend on Wednesdays. So that was one thing I wanted to mention. Um, and then before I get to the mail-in questions, um, it looks like somebody typed in. Uh, should we need to list subcontracts in the table? Um, on a team table, if you're if you're subcontracting, like let's say you have a subcontract where there's like a site PI at a different location, I would do that. 
Um, and depending on the size of your team, you could just either list everybody out, or as I said, you could group them by um, by primary affiliation. So like if you are the primary site, you could list the primary site um, you know, as a header with the, the merged cells in a row and, and list your university and then list the team members who are at that site. And then at the subsite, you could um, have the next grouping where you'd have merge the cells in a row, list the, the university that is the subsite, and then you'd have that site PI and their team members listed. I think I would do that. I mean, when in doubt, include the information, particularly if you're doing a human subjects project and the details of this information can reside in section 3.5 of the human subjects board, because you're not, um, you're not, scraping up against page limits in the research strategy. Like I could understand why you might feel like, oh, I, I'm really tight on space in the research strategy. I don't know if I wanna list all these people, but you could, um, if you're doing a human subjects project, you could say, just have a row that says for team members in the subsite, see section 3.5 of the human subjects work. And if at all possible, if you're doing a non-human subjects project, try to make room um, for the people at the subsite. Remember that you can drop the font to nine point. Um, you don't need a space um, after the rows in a uh, the text in a table. Um, and if it's if it's a lot of rows and you find that the table is hard to read without inserting space, um, you could shade lightly shade like a very pale gray every other row, just to make it a little more. Um, a little easier to skim and to visually kind of skim and grasp the information without having to insert white space, which, you know, is in high demand <laughs> on a research strategy. Um, so anyway, that that's my answer to that. I, I hope that that answered your question. Um, if you have, if there's more that you wanted to ask, feel free to ask them. Um, and then in terms of the mail-in questions, um, I actually had two that were very similar. I'm going to read one of them to you. Um, okay, one of them was, um, I just started as an assistant professor and will be applying for my first NIH grant this summer or fall. I'm interested in both the NIAID DP2 and the NIH Director's Award DP2, which is not institute specific and is out of the common fund. And I'm trying to figure out if it makes sense to apply for both. Do you have advice about how different non-overlapping two proposals would need to be to allow application to both. For example, would having one to two similar aims and one to two new aims be considered, quote, significant and substantial change in content and scope, end quote. Could the big picture concepts and impact be similar? The shorter answer is yes. Any other rules of thumb or examples that are more concrete than the guidance from NIH and allowable submissions. So um, this is a great question, and I actually received this in several different forms in the last week. Um, and I'll I'll tell you what those other ones are in a moment. But um, for this particular um, situation, I would say that um, it's really important to have um, non-overlapping aims in general at NIH. There are very few instances where it's allowable to have overlap in the aims. And what constitutes non-overlap is always a little bit of a judgment call. Um, this is something where I often see, uh, at, not often, it is not uncommon for an application to be flagged as a, a duplicate. I mean, this is something that I've seen many times in the course of my career. So it does happen. And um, my understanding is that um, the, the sections that are probably under heaviest scrutiny, and I think a lot of this is done, um, you know, um, with computer programs, you know, like an NLM type thing, natural language uh, processing, NLP. Um, I think the areas that are under most scrutiny are the aims page, the title, um, and the abstract. I think these like high profile kind of sections are under um, heavy scrutiny. So sometimes it's a writing fix. Sometimes it's a matter of making sure that um, the way you're describing it makes it sound dissimilar. Um, so, and so people are always asking me questions like if I use the same 
methods, but on a different population, is that okay? I'm like, okay, on an R01, that probably is okay. Like if you're, as opposed to like a CATS, where it's got to be a substantially new direction that probably doesn't constitute a substantially new direction in that instance. So, um, so I think part of it is checking with your program officer to make sure that there truly is enough difference between the projects. Um, and then some of it is just making sure that the way you're describing it is dissimilar enough and that the, you're really kind of emphasizing the differences between these projects in these prominent places in the application um, where people are uh, likely to be looking. Oh, I missed that. Somebody made a comment and I missed that. It was cleared by my team, if you could. Uh, put that, is there a way to put that back in? Because I missed the comment. Um, anyway, so um, the other instance where the person um, uh, asked a question about this had to do with a competing renewal. So this was a uh, not dissimilar um, question in, in its own way. So this person was asking if, if I am writing a competing renewal and, um, and the the signif is it terrible if the significance and innovation are almost identical to the original A0 that was funded. So this is a situation where a person put in an R01, they got funded, the period of the grant ends, and they're writing what's called a competing renewal, which is a special type of A0, essentially. It's a it's a um you're you're trying to continue the funding on this um, R01. And the big difference between a competing renewal and a brand new A0 is that there's a progress report at the beginning of the approach on the competing renewal. So this particular person is actually an RD said, um, what if the significance and innovation on the competing renewal are almost identical to what was in the um, original funded R01? Is that kosher? And the answer is, yeah, it's probably okay. If it's warranted, sure. Like, you know, of course, sometimes a project takes you in a new direction. And so then you have to rewrite the significance and innovation on the competing renewal so that it's it's relevant to the competing renewal. But often you're continuing in the same general context and the information that you gave about the significance, which might contain like information about knowledge gaps and disease burden information, et cetera, and the innovation, which may have to do with, you know, some methodology that you developed or whatever, would be very similar to those write-ups could potentially be very similar to what they were on the original funded R01. And in that instance, it's actually okay. And my PS to that person, because I, I emailed them my response, my PS to them was um, that really, I you know, the, the bottom line is if the team published adequately on the original funded R01, the reviewers aren't going to really care if there's overlap <laughs> between the significance and innovation from the original funded R01 and the competing renewal. All they really care about is how much you, you published on the original R01. And, you know, they're they're not, if you published a lot on the original um, funded R01, um, they're all will be forgiven, <laughs> you know, if you're, there's overlap. So I wouldn't worry too much about how much overlap there is significance and innovation in that instance. Um, and the comment that I missed was uh, just a comment, loved that Venn diagram, very useful visualization of collaborations, thank you. So um, you're welcome and I'll um, just remind people that that slide is in Master the R Series Chapter 4 approach. If you just run through the table of contents to um, the team table, um, it's it's uh, it'll help you navigate right to that lesson. Um, and I would love to say that I came up with it, but Dr. Conwell did. I just had the sense to recognize a good thing when I saw it and to ask to, to use it. And honestly, that's a, what a lot of good grant writing is. It's not necessarily be always being the person who is so clever at coming up with something. It's being really um, diligent about reviewing lots of applications and noticing what you like and don't like and then folding that information into your evolving sense of grantsmanship. There's almost no better way to become a skilled grant writer than reviewing applications yourself. So that is it for us today. Um, I hope that this was helpful for you. 
Um, I think in two weeks, uh, we have another presentation on AI from um, uh, my colleague, Becky Nero, um, who is going to present findings from um, two published manuscripts that um, address the use of AI in grant writing. And I'm in uh, conversations with an AI expert who is probably going to uh, be coming on to do a mini tutorial as well. This is obviously an area of keen interest for me, um, and I'm getting a lot of questions on it. So you can expect to see um, more on AI, I hope. So, and otherwise, that's it for today. Coming to you, as I said, from New York City. And um, I hope everybody's staying cool in the heat, and I wish you the best of luck in your grant writing, and I will see you next time. Have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye.